the phrase, a margin is a space between our load and our limits. Um, it's our reserves. It's kind of a buffer. It's a gap. It's a leeway. Um, and it's disappeared. Um, one way of thinking about the whole margin issue is that everybody, everybody listening to this or watching this, everybody in the entire world is on a spectrum. All together we are. And it's impossible not to be on this line of margined or maximized or overloaded. If you're at 70 or 80 or 90 percent, you're margined, obviously. You have some space. You have some buffer there. Uh, reserves. If you're maximized, once you get up to 100%, then there's a thin little slice there that says you're maximized. Your capacities are now maximized. Once you slide beyond that and go to 105, 110, 120, 130%, you're overloaded. Now, the question that comes from that is um, where should we position ourselves on this scale? Uh, obviously, people are going to drift to the uh, to the margin side, and they're going to go over to the overloaded side, um, and and back and forth, and that's been normal throughout history, I think. But um, but unusually today, we are being pushed increasingly to the overloaded side, sometimes not realizing it's happening, but it most definitely is happening. This is a different uh, this is a different graph that explains the same phenomenon really in just a bit of a different way. You can see stress on the bottom axis and productivity on the vertical axis. So when your stress is zero, when your stress is zero, when you're just sitting there staring at the wall and drooling, and you don't have a thought in your head and you're not doing anything whatsoever, maybe you're resting. But what is your productivity? Your productivity is zero also. Now as your stress increases, then the productivity starts to soar and it goes up very rapidly. You can see it going along with this slope. Um, and then as you get toward the top, as you're nearing toward point A, you can see that the um, that it starts to the curve starts to bend a little bit and flatten out. So your productivity doesn't keep soaring up, it starts to stop. And when you get to A, then that's where you're maximized. And uh, but then if you continue to push over, then you get into fatigue and you get into exhaustion and you get into burnout. Um, this again is is uh, something that everybody participates in this graph all the time, and if you're over at B and C too much for too long a period of time, it's not bad to be there. It's bad to stay there for an extended period of time, because then reliably bad things are going to start to happen to you. Um, this is an example of overload, and uh, I love this guy. I don't know how in the world. I don't know how in the world they stack this. They deserve some kind of award. And you can look the truck in front of them; it's got the same deal. But it's definitely overload. It's creative overload, and I like it. But uh, now these people, I have no words for. I, they're just so completely awesome. How in the world they possibly pull this off? Uh, but uh, God bless them. Um, and this brings it home because this is. Uh, this is at Home Depot, and the guy put 3,000 pounds over his back axle. He put 800 pounds of concrete in his back seat, and he made it six feet. And he broke his axle, wrecked his car. That's his wife in a coma in the front seat. He was last seen walking down the street. So um, this is a metaphor for life. I mean, a lot of people are really overloaded, and uh, we, we've got to recognize it before we look like this car. So what are some symptoms of overload? Um, there's lots of them on the screen, or many, and I just highlighted some yellow ones because, you know, this talk actually goes for four hours, but I'm going to give one hour. So that means I'm going to compress some things and leave a few things out. Well, I've got enough symptoms highlighted here uh, for us to get the general idea. Apathy is one symptom of overload, and people just sort of stop caring, and that's quite common. Uh, depression also is something that uh, is unusually common today, given the much as, the, 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 as much progress as we have. Um, it's strange that the good life is only endurable under sedation. I mean, depression is a very serious problem. Irritability, anger, hostility, all those three together um, in a triad, and it's a progression. If you think of irritability, uh, then uh, you know you're you're a little out of sorts, and then that leads to anger, and then anger increased as hostility. Now, if you increase beyond that, you get to rage, uh, frustration, disorganization, mistakes, exhaustion, moral failure, relational problems. So uh, you you get the general idea. There are many symptoms that will show up, and your symptoms will be reproducible. Say say your symptom is irritability and 
um, abnormal sleeping patterns and headaches. Okay, those are those are some down below. Each time you get overloaded, that symptom complex will show up and will will inform you that you know it's time to throttle throttle back a little bit. Now, how did we get in this situation? Why should we be talking about margin today? Uh, they weren't interested in talking about that in the 1970s necessarily or the 1950s. Uh, it's because of progress and where progress is and where it's brought us to right now. Uh, progress uh, initially was a great idea. It started really the modern notion of progress about 1800. Um, and it gave us uh, a lot of wonderful benefits. But right now it's backfiring some. I mean, it still gives us a lot of wonderful things, but there's a lot of uh, downside to progress these days. And I'm not a big fan. Uh, progress works by giving us more and more of everything faster and faster. In essence, that's the way progress works. Um, now, most Americans have viewed this with uh, great elation because what they want more than anything else is more and more of everything faster and faster. But when you get too much more, you see progress doing this gives us what I call profusion. So you have this huge amount of more that just keeps growing. And from a Christian point of view, from a kingdom point of view, it's enormously distracting. It might not have any spiritual gravity to it at all, this profusion that just keeps showing up, but it distracts us. And so I'm, I'm frustrated about that and uh, want us to be careful about progress. Margin, on the other hand, is where we recharge our batteries. And uh, we all need our batteries to be recharged uh, from time to time, and uh, maybe on a daily basis, and that's why God gave us sleep, perhaps. Uh, margins where we recover our health. Sometimes it takes a while to recover our health. It's where we rest our bodies and rest our spirits and where we nourish relationships. I'm going to be talking about rest and relationships in just a little bit. That's where we think about priorities. You know, it's a very sad thing to get to the end of your life and realize that you missed uh, your priorities. Um, and margin is a, is a countercultural thing, and I, I, it's, it's been so wonderful that we've been uh, dealing with that in, in, um, in the, 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 the sermons uh, uh, about countercultural, because indeed this is where we, we really should be and is our home. How about margin in the Bible? You don't see the word uh, in the scriptures, but everything that the scripture, well, not everything, but almost everything that God is asking us or commanding us to do is held hostage by a marginless life. And let me, let me illustrate that. Uh, carry one another's burdens. I can give you proof through studies that if you're too overloaded, you have zero interest in carrying one another's burdens. You just want to escape your own. How about walking the second mile? Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, somebody said the second mile is never crowded. How about helping the wounded in the road? Now, this one is really important. Luke 10, uh, Jesus is talking about the, the greatest commandment, having that discussion about the greatest commandment. And um, the, the story comes, well, the greatest commandment out of 613 commandments in the Old Testament, what is the greatest one? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Well, first, uh, hero Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one, the Shema. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all this, thy soul, spirit, heart, uh, mind, and strength, and, um, and heart. Um, so the, and then it goes on to the second is like unto the first, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, that's very important if the first from Deuteronomy is the most important, and this one is linked to it, we have to understand who our neighbor is. And so Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. We would not stop for that wounded person in the road. We wouldn't be the Good Samaritan if you're too overloaded. I mean, yes, of course, some people would be really heroic about it, but uh, most times we simply would not. The witness to the hope and truth we have within us at any opportunity in First Peter, when we teach our children, when we sit and walk and lie and stand, be still and wait patiently for him. I think you can see that um, that uh, when when we're pushed too far on the overload scale, these things tend to drift away from us. So let's start to build uh, margin and emotional energy is the first place we're going to go. And when you start any day, you have a certain quantum of emotional vitality in you. You have a certain amount of reservoir of emotional vitality, and you're you're giving out of that quantum or of that reservoir all day long and you're also receiving back. 
uh, we hope that we're receiving back as fast as we're giving out. And unfortunately, that's not the way it works under these kind of conditions. And so we find ourselves drained by coffee break time. So what are some things that we can do to build back an emotional energy? A very important and probably the most important in a sense of the, of the four that I'm going to look at, margin of emotional energy, margin of physical energy, margin of time, margin of finances. If you're emotionally defeated all the time, then uh, the other margins don't really uh, help you that much. Okay, what, what are some prescriptions here? The first one I would have is nurture relationships. And, and out of 600, in my margin book, I think I have about 75 or 80 prescriptions, but in all of my books, I have like 600 practical suggestions or prescriptions of things that people can do uh, to counter these forces of modernity. Um, I would say that nurture relationships are, uh, are, are, would be in the top 10 of that. Uh, it is so important. Um, the studies show consistently that intact nurturing social support systems translates into good health, good health physically, good health emotionally, good health mentally. And so this is a very precious thing, and we all, we all need that, and we all yearn for that. Uh, God uh, created us connected. He could have created, when you think about this, do, do a little uh, mind game here, that God could have created one person per planet and scattered us across the universe. So he just wanted communion with me and communion with Jason and communion with Gary and, you know, and, and just do that one at a time and it raptured us all together. We would have said, oh, surprise, happy, happy to meet you. But he gave us to each other. And some people say, well, that's the curse. <laughs> because it's the hardest thing we have to do is deal with other people. But that's not, of course, his purpose. His purpose is one of blessing. And so we have to find how to do that and how to do that well. It's very, very important. Uh, one thing is the disclosure effect. Uh, what I mean by this is that I think everybody should have the opportunity to tell their story. Uh, now, some people don't want to, and they, they've got a hard shell around them, and I, I, would, I would then leave them with that. I'm not going <laughs> to invade that space, but, um, but uh, we, we walk around as anonymous people, and, and we don't, somebody says church is where we live alone together, and uh, we have to break that shell if we can and get to know each other on deep levels, and, and if you can become vulnerable, with one another, the disclosure effect can lead to vulnerability. And uh, so you need a safe environment for that. But when you become vulnerable, then that leads to intimacy. And even though that sounds like a touchy feely thing and more for feminines, uh, uh, for females, uh, I would say intimacy is a beautiful Christian word. And I think that it, it should belong to the church that we have intimacy one to get one to another. And, and that's, uh, that's where we really deeply, deeply love each other and care for each other. And empathy, one, one psychiatrist that I like to, uh, to read uh, says there's probably nothing more therapeutic to people that are wounded than the presence of another person through empathy that is, that is there with that person, that knows that person, and that cares about what they're going through. So empathy is very important, but that, that we don't do that a lot of times when we don't know each other and when we don't have the strength for entropy and caring. Ecclesiastes says two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the person who falls and there's no one to help him up. And uh, that's, that's a really sad one, isn't it? And of course it hits all of us, truly. And, and uh, we, we don't want to we don't want to end up in this kind of position. So we we seek to have good strong relationships. Uh, this is father and son on the left, and father and son on the right, and uh, the, the the same house behind them. And it would be wonderful if this was a, a true story and a true picture about you know how things are in families. But we we know that that all of our families have troubles and my family of origin had, had difficulties and I'm not going to go into them. You're probably not going to go into years, years of stories, but uh, you know, the heartaches that exist there. And yet uh, God wants us to be together and, and loving and of one accord. Uh, this one speaks for itself about the value of relationships and, 
And that one speaks for itself, too. <laughs> that doesn't bode too well, I don't think. So we'll just go on. <laughs> Um, I, I read about a man who I stopped in Ohio for gasoline. He drove 92 miles into Pennsylvania before he remember, remembered that he left his wife back at the gas station. True story. Um, I was uh, uh, teaching at the a child psychology conference at Focus on the Family. And um, uh, I, I, one of the things I was talking about is is laughter. We'll get into that in just a little bit. And I said, four-year-old kids laugh once every four minutes. I said, uh, does anybody have a four-year-old child? Then about 10 or 12 people raised their hand. And one guy was real close, and I pointed to him. I said, what's the child's name? And he froze. <laughs> he, couldn't remember. he couldn't remember the kid's name <laughs> at a child psychology clinic uh, at a conference at the folks on the family. So I just quickly glossed over that and went on to other things because I felt so sorry for the man. My goodness, but can you imagine? Uh, one real positive thing, of course, Linda, I always have to invoke her a little bit here, but uh, she would take me to the airport and then drive home. Uh, when she went with, obviously we parked, and otherwise I could drive myself and park and then get the car and come home. But she wanted to take me because we could visit on the way there. It was less stress for me because she dropped me right off, and I didn't have to work at the park and worry about the parking garage being full. And then when she picked me up, you know, if I just drove myself home and I got in, I said I'm home, and she'd say, Oh, how was it? And I said it was wonderful, and talk like for two or three minutes. But now we have an hour and twenty minutes to talk. And so this is a good use of margin for relationship. And uh, it would take three hours each way for Linda, you know, drive in, drive back, and, and so on. But um, it, was a, it was a precious thing. Pets work too. Uh, some pets are called soulish animals. They have the ability to love you. They have the ability to forgive you. They, they, uh, they, they're very, very affectionate and very, very loyal, and sometimes more than humans are. And so, uh, so I, I commend, you know, cats and dogs and horses and um, those kinds of animals. They're therapeutic. Uh, and they watch the kids. And that's no small thing. Um, and there we go. Beware of the dog. The cat is not trustworthy either. And I think we all know that. Um, and there it's proven right there. So so what in penalty, we you teach? You know, now there's a... There's a sweet one. Reconcile conflict. Um, conflict uh, comes so easily these days, and so we have to find ways to reconcile. And the Bible talks about that a lot, forgiving one another and, and, and living in harmony and making things right as fast as possible. The Bible says, the, um, uh, don't let your, the sun set on your, on your anger. Uh, and how about this verse about conflict? If you bring your gift to the altar and remember there that your brother is not against you, leave your gift, go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. So isn't that interesting to um, to think about uh, being checked like that uh, regularly by God and this wonderful um, advice he has for us, this counsel, this uh, um, to go and be reconciled to our brother. Um, or get a long shirt. It doesn't look like it's working too well but by the uh, appearance of their faces. But this is another one now, serve, serve other people. Um, you know, I'm gonna evoke Linda once more. She just loved serving people. For a lot of us, serving is something that we have to ramp up to. I mean, we have to kind of go out there and do it dutifully. And of course it's a joy, but uh, we got a lot of other things to do too, but uh, Linda, as well as many people in the church, are wonderful servants. And the scripture says the servants are the best; they're the highest. You know, it's it's such a wonderful endorsement that uh, that God gives to that. And you know, Mark 10 it says, "Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant." For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life a ransom for all. So, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Uh, so I recommend for uh, for our our relationships uh, for the emotional energy uh, that we serve other people and it works. The feedback works very well. Um, rest. Um, you don't you don't feel you don't see many people uh, described as well rested in America. Um, 
we're busy people and sometimes we wear that as a badge of honor but you don't get any rewards for being well rested but the bible has things to say about rest as a matter of fact he has lots of things to say about rest and uh as a matter of fact um um here's uh, one of the one of the scriptures that talks about it the apostles gathered around jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught and then because so many people were coming and going they did not even have a chance to eat he said to them come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place uh, we don't have to have more um we don't have to have more piety than Jesus when he gets away by himself. And of course, the scripture talks about him doing this. And so I commend it to you that we invest in rest, the appropriate biblical rest. I uh, remember in uh, Matthew 11 it says, come unto me all you that are weary and burdened and I will give you one more thing to do. Um, that's, that's not what he's talking about here. It says, I will give you rest. This is Jesus talking, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And I think about that, how much, um, how much rest is Jesus promising here? Like 30% of what we need, or 50, or 68? What about, what about 100%? Is he promising 100%? I think he is, although I don't think any human being has ever reached that what he's talking about, but uh, we can uh, strive toward attaining that. It's a, it's a precious passage in scripture. I use the free three. Um, these are used across the world, uh, laughter, music, and nature. And um, uh, every culture has a certain amount of these. I mean, there's certain parts of the world that don't have as much laughter as others, obviously, but they're shared and they're gifts of God and we should uh, learn to take advantage of them and I want to explain them just a little bit. Um, laughter, the average person laughs, um, the average uh, uh, child, four-year-old laughs once every four minutes or 400 times a day. And uh, do you remember when Jesus was, uh, they were keeping uh, the, the kids from Jesus and uh, he was he was resting a little bit and the disciples had this barrier around him and then they found out that um they jesus found out that that was happening and the, and the women wanted to bring their children the mothers wanted to bring their children to jesus to bless them and he was incensed he was furious about them and said, let the children come unto me and uh and so, for such is the kingdom of heaven and he received them um and I think if, if Jesus did that, he had to know what four-year-olds are like, and he had to have a bit of a sense of humor. And so I have a couple pictures here, uh, this little girl, first two girls and then two boys, and it uh, must be nice not to ever have a notion of a bad hair day. Um, this one, if you look at the uh, triumphalism of the, little, of the older girl, but look at the baby. The baby's actually got a Mona Lisa smile on her face, and is quite... Uh, quite proud of what's taking place there as well. And now we'll go to the boys. I hope it's okay I include that slide. <laughs> yeah, boys will be boys. So there's laughter and then there's music. And I don't know if God created that at creation or it pre-existed creation. And I have a feeling it pre-exists at creation. Obviously, God created music is a marvelous, unbelievable, uh, mystical gift in so many ways, but it is so it is so healing for, for people. I remember when I discovered about maybe six years ago um, um, Gabriel's oboe. It's a, it's a piece of music, and if you if you punch it in and, and you can listen to it. But uh, when I when I first listened to that, I sat there and I sobbed. It was like three or four minutes and I just stopped and I punched it up, I think 25 or 30 times that same day. It was so wonderful and beautiful and therapeutic. Uh, nature, is the, uh, nature is the third area that God, God is a, a relentless artist and he never stops and he creates such beauty for us. And if you think of this picture here, uh, this could be a picture, an everyday picture in Northern Wisconsin, couldn't it? But if you, think about this, this picture is unique in the history of the universe. If you go pixel by pixel, um, 
that has never existed before and it changes every second. And if you had to pay rent for that, you wouldn't be able to afford five minutes. So it's such an amazing, wonderful um, gift that God has given us. Um, this is Bakerfield, California. And you know what happened here? It rained. These flowers were not there until it rained and God did that. And these flowers were not there. Um, God planted them for us and uh, it's, a, it's a marvelous thing. Let's look at margin in time now. Uh, for a lot of people, they feel this is the, uh, the area of greatest urgency is to uh, get more uh, time. And typical response is when we're short on time, we, we multitask, we shorten our sleep, or we shortchange our relationships. And sometimes we do all three. And uh, of course, it's, it's obvious why we do these things, but they're not good compensatory mechanisms. So multitasking, for example, we don't do that very well. The human brain does not do that very well. Um, and shortening sleep, we're already short on sleep. And relationships need all the vitality that they can get. So, so one of the things about time is to be intentional. Um, this problem that we're looking at with marginlessness and margin in time and our other areas, but this problem is not going to go away on its own. It has to be resisted and intentionality is going to be uh, required there. Your neighbor's not going to solve your marginless problem for you. I mean, they're not ill-intentioned toward you, but they've got their own, they've got their own issues that they're dealing with. And, and so it's up to each of us individually to, um, to, to deal with this. Uh, in terms of intentionality, in James 1, it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Um, so this is, uh, you, you know, we, we, we don't, should read the scripture and think about it for 10 years and then consult some manuscripts and then have to forget it for 10 years and think about partially doing it. Um, it. It's important to get into the word and then just start doing the things that the word says because this this will be a countercultural answer to the uh, overload problems that we have in this world. Another prescription is learn to say no to non-priorities. Um, this is in the top five of, of, all the, of all the prescriptions. This is in top five. Now notice importantly, I say learn to say no to non-priorities. A lot of times we'll say, yeah, I'm, uh, my life is too crowded. I'm way overloaded and I'm going to start saying no to stuff. But then you end up saying no to things that really, truly are priorities in your life. And you only discover that at the end of your life that you missed it. And that's a sadness. So uh, what can we, how can we learn when to say no and when to say yes? Well, increasingly saying no is a mathematical necessity because we, we are given an invitation to so many things, so many things. We already looked at that a little bit, that you simply cannot fit them in any 24 hour day. And so, you have to say, you know, if you have 18 things to choose from today and you can only do 15 of them, you have to say no to three. And so it goes. Um, I was at a church and it was a fairly large church. I spoke on margin and afterwards I didn't go back to the foyer. People were, there was a group of eight or 10 that came right by the platform and I stood up there and I was ask, answering their questions. And finally I sat down there and we were talking and I noticed that the associate pastor who had kind of run the service, I mean, he did the announcements and things, he, he was standing and he was kind of pacing behind me a little bit. And he looked like maybe 38 or something and a father with two kids. I'm just guessing, but that's what it was. And he kind of stormed our group and he says, no has become my default answer for everything. And I thought, wow. Wow, there's a story there. I mean, none of us said anything because it wasn't he was angry, but he was close to it. But he was definitely firm on saying that. And, it, and it, there's one sense in which maybe no should be our default answer to, for everything. And then be, add back quickly the things that are of the scripture. But uh, anyway, just take that anecdote for what it's worth. Uh, one church said we teach our people that no is the holy word. Unfortunately, some people feel that they're so overloaded. What they do is they jettison church and they jettison relationship and they jettison prayer and so on. Uh, did Jesus ever say no? Yes. Jesus said no a lot. And so we can take hope from that and an example from there. I mean, people said, uh, go, go to Jerusalem. He said, no, uh, kick the Romans out. No. 
start an army. No, crown yourself king. No, I mean, he said no to a lot of people. Jesus probably disappointed more people than you can imagine because he did the will of the Father and not the will of the people. And it, was, it didn't mean that he didn't care about the people, obviously, but he had uh, another agenda. This is a verse in, uh, in Titus, the second chapter, for the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Um, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Steve Jobs said, this company needs focusing. Focusing does not mean saying yes, it means saying no. And I think my life needs focusing. You know, margin is a lot about focus. It's a lot about focus. It's not hammocks and it's not being a bum and it's not stop working or stop trying. It's about focus, focus on the things that are important and then do the least. The practice simplicity, Linda and I, these were bedrock principles that we better built our life as simplicity and contentment. I'm going to talk a little bit about simplicity here and then come back to it a little bit in the area of uh, finances and I'll pick up with contentment there too. But why do I have it here in this area of time? Because everything that we own owns us. And the more that you have, the more time that that takes because you have to build space in your house and you put it, you have to paint it, you have to re restore it and maintain it and work to pay it off and so the fewer things that we have, the more time that we're going to have, and simplicity uh, teaches that. Einstein, for example, had a whole bunch of suits, but they were all the same suit. He didn't want to think about fashion. He wanted to think about, you know, it's not, I mean, it's nothing matter with clothes, but he wanted to think about relativity. And you know, Stephen Jobs, he wore black all the time. Johnny Cash wore black all the time. Francis Schaeffer wore the same outfit all the time. So do I, as a matter of fact, you'd be stunned. I wear the exact same thing. Like, well, this is, this is, I've been wearing this to church for the last two years, what I've got on right now. And uh, it just is so easy to do that. Um, so simplicity, I commend that with regard to helping in time. This is a big one, isn't it? This is in the top five or top 10 control technology. The tech is great, except when it isn't. And boy, I tell you, it's a love-hate relationship, isn't it? Um, I have here turn off television, but I mean, it's just not just television. It's all the other things and the platforms and how they consume us and um, how they draw us into there. And so um, one of the things to remember is time-saving technology doesn't. Um, one, one person said, um, uh, you know, if you, if you look at uh, North Africa, I, I was talking to a person from North Africa, and he says, you, you folks have all the watches, but we have all the time. And he was exactly correct. And so how do we make, tech, how do we become the masters of technology rather than technology become the masters of us? This is an older slide, actually, but it still kind of works, I think, right? I mean, 20 years later, and all these things fit in your pocket. I mean, imagine what fits in your pockets today. It's kind of uh, astounding, isn't it? And uh, now, let me, let me ask this question, because I think it's a central and very important question about technology. Does tech help us with human connections? And it's a plus minus, isn't it? Because, I mean, it's helping us here. And so that's positive. But when this is a substitute for real life human interaction face to face, then this is not a very good substitute. And so I think we all understand that tech helps, but it can harm us if technology um, commands all of our attention and we don't have the human human contact that we all really need and that builds up our, our uh, vitality. Sure, I'd love to come over and hang out with you while you talk and text with other people on your phone the entire time. Periodically disconnect. Oh, this is probably in the top 10 or 15 prescriptions. I mean, we've got a lot of them right in a row here, don't we? Um, what I mean here is just find ways to shut it down from time to time. Uh, I, be creative about it. I mean, I have a little suggestion here. Every Tuesday evening, live in 1850. I mean, or, you know, for uh, half an hour once a week or for 15 minutes once a month. I mean, just shut it down. Check in the hotel room in your own hometown to get away. You know, record numbers of people are doing that. And, so you see this uh, this flood to try to disconnect, but it, it's so hard to do. 
and then I commend it to you. I oh, I love my solitude. I just adore it. It's so helpful for me. Um, David in a tough spot, Psalm 55 says, "My heart is in anguish within me. Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest." And I think we would uh, we would hurry to follow David for where, wherever he's going because you know sometimes we want to get around away from this wild world too, this chaotic world. Um, and that, that would do it. Uh, that, that looks nice to me. Now, this is actually in Serbia, if you can believe that. Yeah, wow. I'll give it a try for a night. Another thing is calculate opportunity costs. Uh, this is an economics term, but it doesn't belong to the economics world at all. It belongs to the world at large. And the, the idea here is, um, is that whenever we spend time, money, energy, or attention on one thing, we pass up the opportunity to spend it on something else. Or whenever we spend time, money, energy, and attention on one thing, we pass up the opportunity to spend it on three or four or five things else. And so when you make a choice, then you automatically vacate other choices that you would possibly do. So how do you, how do you make your choices and think about opportunities with regard to this? I want to give you a couple stories here uh, just kind of quickly to show examples of what some people have done. This is Mayo Clinic cardiologist down in Rochester, and he was a um, he was a resident in cardiology. And this eight year old gal came from uh, New York, and she needed a heart transplant. And uh, you get to know the resident doctors a lot better than the staff attendings, because the staff attendings are there for five or ten minutes a day. And then, but the residents, you you see them hours every day, and they're checking in on you all the time. So. It is uh, Stephanie, she, uh, she was talking to the cardiologist and she, said that she got worried when she was going into surgery. And she said, Dr. Ackerman, Dr. Ackerman, can you promise me that I will not die in surgery? And he said, Stephanie, I promise you, you will not die in surgery. And I promise you that I will dance with you at your senior prom. And so this, this consoled her some. And she went in and she came out, she was fine, went back to New York. Grew up a little bit, ninth grade brings it up to her mother a little, and then 10th grade a little bit, and her mother says, well, sweetie, he's a nice man. And then 11th grade, and finally 12th grade, and he says, Mom, he promised he was going to dance with me at the senior prom. And uh, do you think he remembered that? And she says, sweetie, he's a staff cardiologist there. They're very, very busy, honey. I'm sure he had the best intentions, and he encouraged us at the time. But And then the, the girl walks away crestfallen, and and the, the mother writes a note to Dr. Hawker at the Mayo Clinic. It doesn't, she doesn't have the, the number at home, the, the address at home, so she writes to the Mayo Clinic. And he opens that up, and he brings it home, and he shows it to his wife. And he says, I'm supposed to be giving a presentation at San Diego the morning before that, that prom. I'm supposed to be giving a presentation in Orlando the morning after that prom. What should I do? And she stuck her finger on that page and she says, you make this happen. And so he did. And he canceled his, his, his uh, presentations. And uh, the mom was the only person who knew and he made flight arrangements and he flew up there and in the middle of the, I don't know dances, I've never been to a dance, I've never been to prom, but I think there was a break in the middle of it and they're starting back up and he comes in and he comes behind Stephanie and taps her on the back and says, could I have this dance please? And she turns around and she screams and she sobs and she hugs him and she's I'm the luckiest person in the world. And, um, you know, this actually made it on, this actually made it on, uh, on the Good Morning America, they had, and he's a Christian and the family were Christian. And uh, Dr. Alcorn said on that program at Good Morning America, he says, you know, medicine can be a pounding profession and these opportunities don't come up very often. And when they do, you have to, you have to buy them up and, and uh, take advantage of them because this can keep him going for 10 years. There's an international uh, vice president for, I think, Citigroup or something, one big financial institution, and they, uh, he was in, um, there was a Christmas party at the top of a building in, in, uh, in uh, New York City. And so all these wealthy people up there, and they're having this party, very, very expensive, lavish uh, splash. 
And then the CEO gets up and asks, Steve, would you come up and tell us that project you have in Africa? So he didn't know that he was going to call me. He goes up in there. He said, well, some years ago, um, one person came up to him and said, um, um, it was his pastor. That this guy went and talked, was talking to the pastor. He says, I have all these things. I have the car I wanted. I have the finances I wanted, but I'm just not satisfied. And he says, well, what is it that you would like? And he says, well, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I don't know. But he says, but um, I just don't want God to say, why didn't you build uh, orphanages for AIDS children in Africa? And the pastor says, that's pretty specific, isn't it? And so he went over and he built one. And then he built three. And his most precious, he's telling these people from, from Citigroup, um, you know, all these wealthy, wealthy people, that that is the greatest time of his year is when he goes to Africa several times and interacts with these orphanages. And afterwards, they all went up to the platform and asked him how they could do that also. So this is opportunity cost and we're all well chosen. And be available, of course, scripture talks about that. Margin of finances. Um, Let's go through this uh, uh, a little quickly here. I want to, uh, well, anyway, yeah, no. <laughs> it's not ironic I say that. Sign of the times, huh? There we go. Isn't it crazy out? My goodness gracious. Hagar, the comic strip had two rules for happiness. First, be content with what you got. And then second, is always be sure you got plenty. You know, uh, all of life is grace. And before you wake up in the morning with your eyes still closed, you are filthy rich. You are wealthy in so many regards. And it's all grace. You didn't create the air you're breathing right now. Do you, do you understand that? You didn't create the food that you eat or the ground in which it was grown or the ability to seed to germinate. You didn't instruct your GI tract to digest. You didn't tell your brain to acquire language. You didn't tell your DNA in your initial single cell to grow you. You didn't create 10 to the 28th atoms in your body or turn over a trillion, trillion of these atoms every hour. You understand it's all grace. God has lavished us with these tremendous blessings that are hidden and invisible so often, but believe me, they are there. They're very, very wealthy because of what he's already done for us. And examine some motives for spending. Um, recreational a lot of people oh, they're a little bored so they go go buy some stuff and you know that kind of uh that that, that uh, is fun for for a lot of people other people um therapeutic in other words they're they're not bored but they're down and they're um, melancholic and then they go and buy something and you know that works too but it's very short term and after a while you're back to baseline again and addictive also very common so just regard these three uh, motives for spending and um, and beware of them. You know, there's a lot of impulse buying. Um, 50 to 85% of everything is impulse buying. And you go to the store and you have a list, but then you pick up other things that aren't on your list. And sometimes those are necessary and you just got to put them on your list. But a lot of times it's extraneous things that you don't really perhaps need. And I just talked about impulse buying there. Another thing is fast, fast from shopping, fast from spending money. Uh, that's a spiritual discipline to do that every once in a while. Just say, I mean, how long do you want to go? Uh, do you want to you say a week? Do you want to say a month? Do you want to say two months? I just say, how about six weeks? Just don't spend, obviously, you got to buy milk and you can buy gas for your car and so on. But, um, but discretionary spending is what I'm talking about. Just fast for a while and exert that discipline over yourself and, uh, you'll, you'll gain in finances. And what about possession endpoint? You know, when, um, determine what a possession endpoint is for you. I mean, when, when is the cow, the couch uh, good enough, you know, or the car or, or your house or other kinds of things? Uh, um, you know, Linda and I have done that and we rejoice in the simplicity of our life because, I mean, we, we just had enough. And, you know, maybe it's not about the couch. You know, maybe it's the, the person that lays down on the couch that's really important. And uh, you know, it isn't about the couch, and, and, and it isn't about the car, and it isn't about the house, and it isn't about, you know, having handsome kids or um, a college scholarship. I mean, those, those things are all very, very nice, aren't they? But it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about that. And if we can't say that, then those things become idols to us. And we have to be aware of that. 
Jesus said in Luke 12, man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Resist the escalation of the norm. Have you ever noticed that there's this rapid escalation of the norm that's followed by a normalization of the escalation? It becomes the new normal. So it doesn't make any difference if you're talking about like sunglasses, okay? I saw, um, I saw an ad for a pair of sunglasses that cost $4,000. Can you imagine that? I can't imagine. Weddings and funerals, all of these are pet peeves of mine in a certain sense. I, I got to know a pediatric ophthalmologist down in Texas, and um, we, were, we were close for several years, and I had, I'd spoken for him in a conference. And, um, his daughter was getting married. And he loved his family. He loved his daughter. But he says, weddings in Texas, for me, have become a culturally driven nightmare. And this, this attitude doesn't make me very popular with my family right now. But I knew exactly what he was talking about. Hospital beds. My dad died about 10 years ago. And uh, somebody pointed out when I was down there, they said, this hospital bed cost $40,000. One hospital bed, $40,000. 10 years ago, I almost had a meltdown. Oh, my God. Cars, computer features, church programs, kindergarten, birthday parties, Christmas. So um, be careful about the escalation of the norm in your life. And uh, just say, well, enough. Enough is fine. This is fine. What we have is fine. Now, I'm not taking a pot shot at gals here. I mean, this is a nice um, baby stroller. What do you call these things? I don't know. You know, But uh, it's, a, it's a two for there. I think it's a tandem and um, very nice. What, what we had, and I'm not, I'm not saying we're superior to other people but we had that little umbrella stroller you know where you could collapse it down and it has a little hook on the top of it and, and the wheels were just the, the size of a, a, a mid-sized pancake and and Linda you know put Adam in it and went everywhere and had to change out the tires and then when Matt was born Adam was a little bigger and then so on and and uh, so this is a nice one fine I'm not taking away from you but guys I mean this is a little too much right I think it's just uh, escalation of the norm it's tempting, isn't it? This is what I think. This is what I think. You know, he knows other things. This kid thinks he's Superman. He's got the best perspective of anybody. And okay, simplicity. We're back to simplicity again. Hebrews 12. You know, Hebrews 11 is the Hall of Fame of Faith. And then it goes to Hebrews 12 and says, Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. And I think in the sin, this will easily besets and on it goes. You know, a wonderful passage there in, in, in Hebrews 12, but let us throw off everything that hinders, it hinders us from our spiritual life. Let us throw overboard. You're, you're out in the ocean and you got, you're in the life raft and you got to throw stuff overboard. Um, find the things that hinder and just jettison them. Jesus himself says, foxes have holes, birds have nests, the son of man has no place to lay his head. Is he being serious here? Is Jesus homeless? When he was in Nazareth and was a builder, he helped his dad, I'm sure, build houses. He maybe built houses, but he doesn't live in Nazareth anymore. He lives in Capernaum. And there's no record of where he stays when he's there. Uh, a Quaker uh, watched a neighbor move in, and um, we're, kind of, again, we're talking about simplicity here. And the, the, the neighbor had uh, several moving vans and some very nice stuff and is bringing it out. And finally the Quaker goes out and sits down and watches a little bit. Then he stands up and he talks to the neighbor. He says, neighbor, I welcome thee to the neighborhood. And if thee have ever, ever have need of anything at all, please come to me and I will show thee how to get along without it. Now, I wonder if you want him to be your neighbor or not. I mean, perhaps not, but I think actually he would be a, it would be a delightful neighbor to have. Um, there's an ophthalmology conference in Southern California that I was at, and I talked about margin, and several people came around, and we discussed, and then they melted away, and I saw this person, I've got purple vision, she was standing behind me about 10, 12 feet by a curtain back there, being very quiet, and so she came, it's safe for her to come forward, and she said, I thank you for your talk, she says, I've tried for six years to intensively I simplify my life, and after six years of intensive effort, I finally got it down to 100%. It is such an interesting statement. Um, this is uh, what Dr. David Allen, he's a Christian psychiatrist, and he said, some years ago, I worked with a very distinguished professor of medicine who was dying of cancer. Her word to me was this, in spite of the pathos and the pain, dying is very simple. There's no need for long talks or conversation or complex relationships or meetings. 
unexpectedly after being very ill, the professor was healed of the cancer and returned to health. She told me then that she wished she could live in health like she'd lived when she was dying. David, she said, remember that life at its heart is very simple. When we're facing death, only the basic things are necessary. Once we move out of illness, we complicate our lifestyle and live beyond our means and make life more difficult for ourselves. And now contentment. We're going to finish up on contentment and it is touch on uh, uh, physical energy for a little bit. But the contentment is, is not a natural state, but it is a biblically uh, is a biblical state that is commended so often to us throughout scripture. Um, uh, Philippians uh, 4, for example, not that I'm speaking of being in need, this is Paul speaking, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In, any, in every circumstance, I've learned, learned, he had to learn the secret. It is a secret. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abund abundance and need. And so this is a transcendent secret that he's talking about. And we should yearn for that because it is a precious, precious gift. Uh, contentment and sibling and simplicity are siblings, but contentment is the elder one with the honor. Uh, it, is, it is greater than simplicity is. Emmanuel Kant says, give a man everything he desires, and yet at this very moment he will feel that everything is not everything. Spurgeon said, you say, if I had a little more, I should be very satisfied. You make a mistake. If you're not content with what you have, you would not be satisfied if it were doubled. John Kenneth Galbraith, Harvard economist, Nobel laureate, says the concept of satiation has very little standing in economics. The more wants that are satisfied, the more new ones are born. I'm going to introduce you to a poor Methodist woman in the 18th century. She says, I do not know. The 18th century means the 1700s. She says, I do not know when I've had happier times in my soul than when I've been sitting at work with nothing before me but a candle and a white cloth and hearing no sound but that of my own breath, with God in my soul and heaven in my eye. I rejoice in being exactly who I am, a creature capable of loving God, and who as long as God lives must be happy. I get up and look for a while out the window and gaze at the moon and stars, the work in all my hand. I think of the grandeur of the universe and then sit down and think myself one of the happiest beings in it. Margin of physical energy, let's just go very quickly on sleep, nutrition, and exercise. We're sleep deprived, we're overnourished, and we're deconditioned. And uh, I would suggest value sleep. Um, God created sleep. He didn't have to create sleep. He created sleep. Jesus slept. Um, take a nap. As I love taking naps. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes helpful. And uh, strangest location sometimes. Uh, Psalm 3 and then Psalm 4 also talk about sleep. Psalm 3, I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. In other words, you can take a nap because God will watch the universe while you're sleeping. In peace, in Psalm 4, 8, in peace I will both lie down and sleep. Lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Uh, physical energy, nutrition, uh, not, you guys know all this. Decrease the intake of calories, replace the processed snacks with fruit, vegetables, mix stay at home. I, I have a little big one list here, but you, you know them all and you can get them in other places. But mix stay at home, probably this dad should have just stayed at home because he's immortalized on this poor, oh, let's go, let's go. And the last one is exercise. Exercise for the heart and for the muscles and for the flexibility, for the mind and spirit. Exercise works well for all of these things. It's never too late to start. Uh, bike or walk, um, you know those. I want to jump down uh, to this verse in 1 Corinthians 6. You've heard this before, perhaps, but we're talking about the human body that God created in magnificent ways. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, who you, ha who you have from God? You're not your own, for you are bought with the price. So glorify God in your body. I'll finish with a story from Elaine Ang. I, I love this gal. 
Uh, she actually teaches in a seminary in Manhattan, Alliance Seminary in Manhattan. She went to Princeton. She went to Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She was OBGYN residency in her second year. She was having trouble seeing. She went to see the ophthalmologist. The ophthalmologist came back and says, the result is retinitis pigmentosa. She said, how long do I have? And he said, two years. She's going blind and she has two years. She said, the Lord had already started working in my heart to somehow begin to cope with this diagnosis, even before I heard of it. I was in a residency with two children, a baby and a toddler. I was torn between my children and my job. When I heard the news, I was startled, but then blessed. She heard the news she was going blind, and she was blessed to realize that this was part of the Lord's answer to my dilemma. There was no point in continuing in the surgical subspecialty. I resigned that day thanked the Lord, went home and had some of the greatest years being a full-time mother. This is her preaching at a church, so her giving her testimony at a church. This so-called tragedy in my life, she says, was very much for the good. I had the chance to see and care for my children during those precious young years, to play with them, sing songs, teach them, feed them, do all those wonderful mothering things that many take for granted. And now that they are grown, I can see in my mind's eye all those great images and memories. I enjoyed motherhood so much that I would not have changed my life in any way if given the chance. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. And I thank for your patience, Father, with us and your kindness and your mercy. And I pray that, Father, in very deep ways, you would plow furrows of, um, furrows of dedication and of faith and of um, sanctification, Lord, that we'd abandon ourselves to you and that the surrender would be a glad surrender. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Come quickly.